recording. So we're recording this for everybody to listen to, anyone who else is following open source development and open source business development. It's kind of a new topic. Not a lot of people talk about how you actually cultivate enterprise in a completely open way where your intent is to distribute that enterprise to many people around the world because you're not afraid that that's going to hurt you. In fact, you think that's actually going to completely help you and make your business case better because the value proposition is the open part. And how do we devise business models that work with that to make it happen? So, uh, Brian uh, and I met last night. Uh, I talked at his class at UMKC on social enterprise. It was great. We also met with another person on the SBIR grants, STTR grants. So I introduced briefly what we talked about in the morning, but maybe we can, uh, the idea here was to, to start documenting as much enterprise options that we have here to develop with open source ecology in terms of the open source machines, but also other, other aspects like, like grants or collaborating with other organizations like, like Brian's Foundation for Regeneration. We have BNIM architects who are collaborating with us on a CDECA home. We've got the UMK, UMKC Center uh, that we visited last night. There's lots of opportunity when we work openly, we open up the boundaries and, and involve everybody. So um, I did start a, or that was Odundo, he started a working doc where we're capturing some of the thoughts. Um, but maybe, maybe we can go introducing ourselves in terms of what we think are some real good opportunities that we see in front of us and actually start all of us get into the document that, that we just uh, shared there. Uh, if you can. So click on that. So, yeah, so the, the document is there. Um, and we'll go as far on it as we can in terms of collaboratively editing and recording. Katrina, do you want to get yourself on the computer? No? Okay. Great. Uh, Okay, so what I'd like to do is pretty much capture as we go forward in the enterprise sessions, uh, the objective is to, to develop what we're working on here, the, so the business side of the CD go home and the allied things that can come out as we think about six months from now, what do we do, can we actually make, make a living, uh, more of us doing the making a living out of the work that we do. In the workshop, it's actually starting to come together and, and uh, look pretty good because we're building a lot of the modules and we're seeing some of the the workflows and ergonomics in terms of we're building a real thing and we see it in front of our eyes and you can see okay well if we get so many hours per house we can make so much revenue happen from that if we've got a good design then then we can uh, create a product that actually works and the concept is the efficiency that's involved there but Let's maybe go through, and, and Brian, uh, welcome to the show here as well, as, as you're remote there um, at your house. But I'd like to hear and, and document, so I'll take notes, and I encourage everybody to take notes in the working document, the, 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 the Google Doc, simply the open source enterprises, and record as much and, and continue evolving the thinking, capturing some of the critical issues. Uh, for me, the, the thing that I think is super valuable for any entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, or open source entrepreneur is, is documenting the insights that otherwise would be very hard for you to learn on your own. And that's the whole part of the collaborative effort to make it easy for everybody. So we're sharing this information openly without fear that uh, someone might uh, take us out of business. We, we don't think like that. And, and therefore, we are willing to reveal as much as possible as our value proposition. So. Uh, maybe I'll start with that. Um, uh, what I see, maybe maybe frame it around what we see, because I mean there are so many opportunities here, and I think a lot of this is first maybe we can share the thoughts that we have on what's a particular um, development and maybe some insights around that, what gets us excited and and what we could see as a as a possibility. So I'll start. Um, maybe I'll start, and uh, I'll mention two things because I see there's. There's two, uh, two main things that I see coming on my side that I could see a clear revenue model. It's, it's literally like, can you imagine this? Can you execute it? It starts with real clarity on what, what's involved. 
what I see is uh, still the same, same old, same old we've been talking about for a long time. And that is the model where we're getting the efficiency of the house build. Um, I'm looking at a general figure of about 500 hours per, per house that we build. And that's kind of the milestone in my mind that we're shooting for. If we achieve that, I think all of us could be happy in terms of, yes, we probably can simply um, get clients. Well, client, we're not talking yet about marketing, but just the product side first. Of course, then you have to have marketing. But we're at the product stage at this time where we're developing very clearly. But I'm seeing that if we can get this down to 500 hours of build time per house, that is sufficient. Like, what's the sufficiency criterion for, for an enterprise? I could see that. So the economics are 50, uh, 50K for materials, 50K for the service, fee, if the model is a turnkey build for a customer that we find. So I see that as perhaps the most scalable, largest market item. There's like a million or two, uh, up to 1.5 million clients like that that we could capture if we were to capture an entire new housing market. But of course, we don't need that. Only a few, of the, a few would suffice for the first year. Um, but the market on that is very large. The idea that you're providing a turnkey house to a person that that they buy that from you, ideally you would have, well, first you got to start with a single model, but I see that evolving into a designer where you can design any kind of a modification of this larger or smaller, smaller size. And the economics work if it's 500 hours, if the current model is like, if OSC is running and there's overhead and things like that, we could pay people 50 bucks an hour. So it's 500 hours times 50 comes out to $25,000. Uh, so if we're paying actual workers 50 bucks an hour, this I think could work. And then there's 25K that would go to OSC for overhead and organization and all that. That's one model that I could see very clearly, like specifically right now. We're, we're finished at the six months, 500 hours. And that would make it work. I think we can possibly do a little better to uh, that would definitely be sufficient if it goes it's all about how far can we get in terms of development and I think if we don't get there if we don't get to to that metric of 500 uh, less than that like I would say we can squeeze by if we're if we're if our time is still about a thousand hours per build I mean that's twice that's a huge difference in efficiency and but it's really that can we get to to a very highly efficient um, state in our work that's one model so the other model is uh, that's a nutshell of it and i could see very clear like if we have that milestone this house that's a thousand square feet uh, 500 hours 25k we pay out to workers 25k goes to the organization that's the nutshell that's like the the one paragraph executive summary of what i could see as working assuming that we've got uh, everything in place, the product is developed, and then we're able to secure clients. Now, as soon as we can get that, I believe, and we can offer something, like yesterday we were talking with the architects from BNIM, BNIM, and they, they are saying, well, whatever you do with that, it better, wherever you put it in any neighborhood, it better fit. I mean, that was one of the comments we had. You can't just plop some spaceship from elsewhere. But I think we're quite flexible on that. We can skin it as well as landscape it to fit. You can have different different coverings on a house or whatever. So I think I think that could work. So the second one that I see very clearly is um, so the grant grant stuff with with uh, SBIR STTR like we got connected to last night, where effectively because we have worked on this for the last decade, we've got many many prototypes. Uh, the message I got from Jesse, who I met yesterday. Um, Sorry, Brian, can you tell us what's the name of the center that Jesse works for? It's, what's the name of that so people can Google it and we can put it in the notes? Um, it's called MIDE, Missouri Institute. can hardly hear you, though. Uh, can you... Can you... Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, pretty good. Can you maybe, like, get close to the mic because you're still somewhat low? Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Pre pretty good. Uh, can you guys hear? No. I, I might have to repeat for the guys here. They they may not be able to hear, but uh, I don't know why it's so weird. Um, it's it's quite low. It's called MIDE, uh, Missouri Department, Missouri Institute of Defense and Energy. Something like that. M I D E. Yeah. Mhm. Mm M I D E.
Institute of Defense and, and Energy. Yeah. Okay. So Google that, Google what they do. That's the contacts we met with Jesse, who's a director of research. Is that correct, Brian? For the yeah. MID? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so with that said, we was very encouraged about the possibility of grants, which are, uh, we can literally take every single project that we're working on actively. Uh, so I mentioned some of the, those in the, in the Google Doc, everything from the open source microfactory, the CEB press, nickel iron batteries, aquaponics based closed loop water systems, which we're developing, large scale 3D printers, CNC torch table, tractor, micro tractor, 360 degree backhoe. There's possibly some of the CNC machines. I mean, that's all things that we have prototyped to some extent and we can take to the finish line um, with, with uh, grants such as SBIR and STTR. So um, I would see that as a priority for us to spend at least some time looking into that. And we just haven't done that because we weren't really exposed to the, those kinds of opportunities. But definitely, um, I'd be interested personally in, in writing some of that. I mean, I, I could crank one of those things out basically exact like an executive summary in five pages you know i, well, I think about it quite so a bit so on the grants the, um, we can crank those the sbir the deadline is like august 3rd for this cycle funding yeah and it's also only for for-profit businesses yeah um that intend to launch a commercial product sure that doesn't exclude us we can start or partner with with someone who's who's got a, a for-profit organization there's other ways to do uh, I think with the STTR, the other way to, that's the other brand of grants I think we were talking about, you have to be an, an edu um, a research, uh, some kind of a research, nonprofit research center. Um, that could, we could qualify for that so we can look into more. So is the SBIR completely off limits to nonprofit organizations? I'm not sure. Yes, but the SPCI has grants where you can create like a, you can get like incubator type yeah. funding. Yeah, so that, that could be interesting. Um, so Question. Yeah, go ahead. For the, for the one that's due August 3rd, uh, what is due? Is it just like a short, like kind of like free type letter thing or is it a full long application, do you know? Uh, I don't know myself. Oh, Jesse mentioned that the cycle starts August, i.e., so we have to, I guess, I, I was taking it, they start applications August, but I guess not, so right now, so it's perfect timing, actually. Um, a little rushed, every time. Oh, yeah. Because um, sometimes it might just be like a short letter that wouldn't be that okay. difficult to submit. Well, I understand it's a five, five page <clears throat> summary plus a a more extent, uh, basically a slide deck that, that you send to them, this is the value proposition. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's something we can consider. I mean, the realistic question is for us, it's like, okay, well, I don't have to write this, I can work with somebody or uh, we should talk about if there's possibilities to collaborate with people uh, to, do, to write, do this grant writing. I mean, absolutely. So when we say uh, we can do it, I don't mean I necessarily have to do it all myself. I never say that. I, I will always say, okay, we're, we can collaborate with people or bring some other people in. If we decide to pursue it, then we, we could allocate some resources to making that happen. Um, so those are two things I, I could see definitely uh, contributing. It's, it's something that, I mean, of course, then we can apply, you know, we can do it maybe as a thing that's, if we don't want to catch this cycle, we can, of course, catch the next cycle. The concept is that that's something feasible. Like, say we're graduating here in six months, um, maybe you guys want to do something like that, and, and since we have all this prior art here you can build on, I mean, that's a perfect opportunity. I'm thinking this is like, wow, uh, you're investing in this training, and out of it you can say, oh, we've got these contacts, and we've got, we've got the tools and techniques that we learned, and we can maybe apply it to that, exactly. So I, I'm quite encouraged about the future for all the people coming here, um, including myself, and anyone who collaborates remotely as well. So um, that's great. That's just a great opportunity. So I'll quit at that. And uh, so maybe we can go around. Who wants to go next as far as what what we think are some of the most uh, potent things we can develop as enterprise? Uh, just, just getting a throwdown of all the possibilities here. <coughs> Anybody?
Anybody? Anybody? For a second, and and relaunch it. Who wants to go next, though? I'll go next. Okay. Um, so, Paul, please uh, let me just join right back in. Okay. So we're we're back we're on. Back on is that somebody, somebody in here, or where's the echo coming from? Okay, can everybody outside outside of the speaker please mute? So we'll have uh, the next person in line here. We'll share our stories and we'll uh, record that. So please actively try to edit the working doc so we can catch all of this. And of course, we can, since we're recording the video, we can go back in the notes and capture anything that we have missed. Um, so Paul, do, Paul, do you want to go next then? Okay, so we're going to have Paul, who's here on site, feed in with his next feedback. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, so Paul, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, share the screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Looks like it. <clears throat> Great, so I'll start with just... Uh, editing the main document that Martin posted. Hi everyone, I'm Paul. I've been building walls with me for the past week. Uh, speak up, man, because we're recording it on this yeah, here. Yeah, my name is Paul. Um, I'm an apprentice here at OSC and in Detroit. I've started a company called Detroit Arcology, and we have presented a design to the city of Detroit for multifamily CEB housing using the CEB ecohome design. And so in Detroit, I've spent um, the last several months since October becoming familiar with the pipeline to buy inexpensive land. There are a lot of empty lots and also abandoned buildings in Detroit. Many of them are owned by the Detroit Land Bank, who has a mandate to um, see them put to productive use. Their incentive, of course, is to gather property tax revenue, but you know, the wider mission is to serve the citizens of Detroit. Um, you know, it's one of the formerly great manufacturing centers of the U.S. which is making a comeback and to be part of that. And there's definitely a big need for affordable housing, so many neighbors and residents are excited and open to new experimental ideas because they feel like the existing ones and the you know, government haven't been able to help them. Um, there's a high foreclosure rate. Um, you know, many of you are familiar with this, this problem where uh, people leave a city and then um, the people who are left behind are less able to maintain the infrastructure and pay the taxes, and so oh, yeah. they tend to leave even more, and then at least more foreclosure rate for people who, are, who stay behind then, and it's kind of a doom cycle. But um, there is a way to reverse it, and I think CD Go Home can play a part in that. So we took a lot, so one lot is uh, 6,400 square feet, and uh, the price from the land bank is $1.40 per square foot, which is very below market rate. Um, probably it's, it's comparable in Kansas City as well, or St. Louis. You know, many cities yeah. in the Midwest that have been overlooked by the real estate markets are great candidates, you know, um, towns in Indiana and, and so forth. And uh, so that works out to be $9,000 for a lot. And this is a lot you can build a CEP home on. You can build a greenhouse on for an urban garden. So it's good to experiment. It's, uh, you know, I lived in New York City before that, and it was prohibited to uh, acquire a lot for any kind of experimentation. But you could adversarially just sort of take over a lot, and the city usually wouldn't stop you if um, if the neighborhood liked you, if you're doing, if you're benefiting the neighborhood. So that's kind of a, a squatting adversarial approach, which um, is an alternative. Is one is one we can talk about, and not one that I'm discussing here. So 
Uh, this would be the first seat. Let's see. You're, I think you're muted, are you? Or no? Because I'm not hearing. Um, are you? I'll try unmuting. Try unmuting. I just yeah. want to make sure I wasn't causing problems. Oh. Sorry, about Sorry about that, Brian. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay. Maybe, so maybe, 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 maybe refresh. Just quick review of what you just said. Uh, I don't think anyone, anyone remote was hearing you. Sure. sure. Uh, can someone remote, like, ping yeah, if they can hear me? This is my practice content. I'm happy to, like, give it again yeah. uh, next week or in the future. Brian, you're here. You should definitely be good, though. I mean, we'll see. But... Guys, you can hear, you can hear right? You can hear, right? Uh, somebody say yes. Somebody affirm from remote. Can somebody so Paul speak and, and see if hey, they can hear you? Can someone remote verify they can hear me? You can. Okay. Uh, more remote from Jeff. Jeff is remote enough. The next person over can hear me. <laughs> That's good to That's know. Good to know. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, anyway practice, practice talk. talk. Thank you, everyone here for coming to my TED talk. How many how many houses are going to try and build in Detroit? Uh, that's a good question. We want to start with one as our prototype, just to be the first to be home in a major uh, American city. You know, Kansas City also would be a major American city, um, but you know, I, I live in Detroit, so I've been putting the most effort in there. And then it could be toured by city officials. It could be potential franchise builders and people who want to um, be builders of this methodology because you know it's clearly cheaper and has a lot of great benefits over traditional building. It's just unusual. It's just people don't know it yet. So this is one way to get them familiar. So it seems less strange. Potential customers, people who want this home. You know, if we build a city of a home and they like it, they just walk by in the street and they say, like, hey, who built that? I, I want one of those. Uh, potential OSC contributors, people who, you know, I talked to many people who wanted to come be here, but they couldn't because of the tuition or the time commitment or the distance. Even before to leave Detroit, they, they would have. So if a home is there, they can come by and see OSC in person. Neighbors, you know, just people who would live next to an OSC home and the wider world. So those are the benefits of building in Detroit. I'll get off my soapbox. And then um, the CEB and geothermal approach would be well suited to Detroit because there are extremes of winter and summer. Those of you who have been to Detroit, um, yeah. you can get to you know, two degrees uh, Fahrenheit and you know, so sometimes less. So, and that's for most of January and February. So pretty extreme. Um, and then also with you know, the August and July time frame, like now, being very hot and also have flash floods, um, they're going, they're going through right now. And so. Geothermal and CEB would be flood proof, uh, fire proof, uh, would provide energy, um, sorry, temperature stuff with stabilization, which currently I think only Earthships uh, brag about having like, people can survive in the high desert or the blazing summer heat um, comfortably in an Earthship that stays at 70 degrees. And bulletproof and earthquake proof. Bulletproof and earthquake proof. Yeah, very important. Yes, very important. important. Yes, you can, you can build in LA, um, disaster relief areas, LA, um, yeah, so, so on and so forth. Question. So you said that this kind of land is available in most cities where there's low cost access to anyone who's a social entrepreneur or a profit seeking person or? Yeah, they just been overlooked. Like if you name a city in the Midwest, like Bloomington, Indiana, Cincinnati, Ohio, most cities in Ohio, actually. Um, you know, people say Alabama, Mississippi, you know, it's probably very similar. Probably towns in Kentucky, you know, I, I haven't lived in those areas. You know, even I overlooked them, and, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma, and people consider that flyover country, so, uh, you know, literally, we can throw a dart at a map, and if it's a city that we may have heard of, but we thought no one would ever go there, that's probably a great place to buy land. And that is from the city, or like who is the, the source? Of, the city of Detroit specifically has uh, taken these lands back. Usually, um, their evictions or foreclosures, usually foreclosures, people have left, um, and or they couldn't pay their back taxes, and the city has taken them back and wants to um, give them to a responsible owner. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, that in Detroit specifically, that um, experienced the biggest flight of people to the suburbs. And so they have the biggest stock. You know, it's a city of like 800,000 people now, and it's designed to be 
a city of uh, millions. So right. So you're saying that for about a dollar forty, I can get a square foot anywhere in a major city that's got foreclosed properties. Well, I can't say anything about other cities, but that's those numbers that's right. from Detroit, and I know the process and I know what they're looking for. Like they do want to fit in the neighborhood. They're okay with a weird-looking house, like. CEVs. Um, I have fit to them a frames, which are uh, another sort of distinctive design that is used for cabin rentals and off-grid vacation Airbnb situations. And they're okay with like one or two lots in the neighborhood being that way, but not the whole lot because it lowers the property value and it's a little unusual. So you have to pitch it carefully. We tried uh -huh. to buy like a 15,000 square foot lot, and that was too big for these like small designs, and so like it's mismatched. You know, mm -hmm. we we suggest these other lots instead. And you know, that's several months. So I'm happy that all the months that I spent to um, give that advice or experience to someone else, or to have them work with us, ideally, have us collaborate. Because um, the goal is, you know, Detroit's not set up like New York, where you like click a website, click a button on Zillow, and then close on the property in like 30 days. That's that's not the case. It's like months of back and forth. And is your use to have the city? Um, is there, is the city department handles it? Are they funded enough for workers to show up every day to answer your phone calls? Like, you have to definitely leg it. You have to uh, drive the process a lot. No one is going to um, complete your project for you, for sure. It would be useful if you can document your experience. I mean, have, are you documenting that anywhere outside of your head? or? <laughs> uh, we have a Trello board, which is like our day to day um, um, activities. and. Findings. It's probably like the only place to document it, and then like my my emails, DetroitArchology.org. So I, I put that link in the document that contains sort of the most relevant things, um, like the the city design, um, the second house that we that we're renovating right now. Um, you know, we have square chat and forums if people want to get involved. Mm -hmm. We have a meetup every month. It's going to be virtual, so I'm going to be calling in from here on July 21st and through Zoom, and so people. Who are interested, like just you know, random Detroiters who saw our our mm -hmm. ad or our website, to join yep. and ask questions, and we're going to work with them to see what they would want to rent. So it's important to connect with customers. We don't want to design something abstract that we think someone wants because the customer is the one who's going to be spending money on this. Yeah. Well, what day is that? Sorry, I missed. Uh, it is the last Wednesday of every month. So. Okay. This one is on July 21st at 5.30, so I'll, I'll put that link uh, <coughs> Have you found that the city is rather supportive, or yes. they're like... I think they, they think it's very uh, unusual, and I, I'm impatient, like, because I just came from New York recently, like I want to get things done, done, done. Like if someone tells me the sidewalk is going to be demolished in two months, like I expect it to be demolished in two months. And uh, when I email the back, they'll be like, oh, it hasn't happened yet? Oh, well, like maybe try emailing these other people. And, uh, uh, or, you know, just chill. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's winter, we're all, we're all doing our best. And so I, yeah, I, I definitely get stressed out. I wanted to drive faster. And they're very supportive. There's, that's not the mindset in Detroit right now. Uh -huh. Okay. But they do ex uh, support experimental structures. Like there was another big developer from Brooklyn that built these large uh, Quonset hut out of aluminum structures. And that's like a multi million dollar. That's from Brooklyn hipsters who are like leaving New York City prices. Um, so other people are capitalizing the market. And so there's no reason that open source uh, approaches for affordable risk purposes should do it too. Mm hmm. Share. This is the lot we pitched. It's at 2091 Seward Street. So if you want to Google Maps it, Google Map it. It's a R3, so it's zoned for three families. What's this address? 2091 Seward. Yeah. In Detroit, the neighbor's called LaSalle Gardens. It's actually only a few blocks from the our first two houses. Mm -hmm. And yeah, anyone, yeah. We, you know, we welcome everyone to come visit us in Detroit. You can come stay 
um, at, our, at our two houses, we're getting, you know, we're probably working plumbing in a few months in the second house. And, uh, so part of the time when I'm checking out of the workshop is when I'm like calling contractors and dealing with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to have a community garden grow food and uh, a driveway so that people can car share if people can buy their own car. And this design was for the original uh, city micro home, which, you know, I think is like 300 square feet. Um, so it's quite small. And we wanted to make it aligned on the south axis so that it could get solar power and passive heating. Um, and the city was okay with that. They, they wanted the outline facing the sidewalk to be more straight. And even then, that's not a hard requirement. But many things they said suggested they wanted to combine the three buildings. They asked, like, why are you building three separate buildings? Why not make the one building? It's like, oh, well, that's a great idea. I just, the design came to me from the open source design, the original design from Katarina. It's a single home. Oh, uh, you know, I was just going to smush them together uh, into one, like even just like double walls in between for better sound insulation because compressed air for this great sound insulation. And one reason people want their own home is to like, not be over their neighbors all the time. So uh, if anyone here is interested in helping me, we can probably do something way more clever than just smushing three um, microphones together. But that will work. And, um, so that's the approach right now. That, that was our main feedback. Oh. We, I, you know, I, used, I learned Sweet Home 3D for the first time, and I just like copied and pasted the homes three times, and <laughs> some solar panels on top, and lined them to the south, and uh, drew an example of like what the cars, what cars look like, what an outdoor shed, the driveway look like. Um, yeah, here's some photos of our first house. You know, we already have a pull mount solar panel and community garden that we grow uh, food in. Um, yeah, very actually, you know, one of the more rewarding aspects of um, the community living, so I'm excited to make another one with them. So you got a couple of lots already? That's You actually bought them already, or? Uh, my friend Adrian bought one lot and uh, one house, so he went away. That's his, his house in this picture here, with a garden solar panel. So I've been staying there, and then I bought a second house at... 3731 Northwestern. So that one is the one that needs to be rehabbed. And that, that's probably the one that, if anyone visits me and wants to work on the project, we would live there and like work on the project full time. So it's this house. Um, here, it's a you know, three bedroom, uh, two story home was built in the 1920s. Uh, it has like a closed off garden and a garage in the back. Um, but yeah, an attic and basement that we want to finish. And, and how much was that? That one was thirty-four thousand. And thirty-four thousand. Uh, wow. Yeah, so I, I gained more experience in real estate negotiations where if I can tell what a house is worth, I like lowball them, uh, and with no concessions. I say like, well, I know the house is trash or it's not been lived in for two years, so I'm not going to nickel and dime you on every repair. I'm just going to say, this is my offer. It's much lower than what you asked, but I'll accept it. No questions and. It went through in like less than 30 days, so they were very eager to sell. And um, yeah, and so um, that part I would probably say is my strength is like finding underpriced assets and kind of like pulling the trigger. Was um, was that like once again community land trust? No, that was a private owner. That was a private owner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the land bank is slower. It is cheaper, for sure. But you have to, you know submit a review of what you'll do with the design and they have to approve and uh, if it's been demolished recently they have to check that the sidewalk has been demolished and there's a lot more bureaucracy to get the cheap price. It's like a trade off. Mm -hmm. But there are auctions in September so if people want to bid on um, Detroit houses, uh, September is the time frame. So you can bid on these $1,000 houses but you have to get them up to code in six months. Um, so it's a little stressful. It's not just like relax. But I don't know, we were able to build a house in six months, much less than six months here, so we wanted to renovate a one thousand dollar house in Detroit, we can do it. Huh. That that new one. A thousand thousand dollars yeah. starting price or typically they go way higher than that or it's a starting price. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. I mean even if they go higher it's still like a two thousand dollar house in Detroit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 
fit within a framework of okay there's a housing crisis and people can't afford housing is it simply because okay this is like the dumps like really undesirable areas and nobody wants to live there is that kind of how the lot the, the psychology there or I mean it is rougher than other cities and you know when I first moved there I had some concerns but I would go back every few months and I would see you know my friend Adrian's house like transform the neighborhood get better so I could see the changes the deltas over time where I believed um, I knew where it was going, whereas like most people, I think, just see a snapshot. They think, "Oh, it's going to stay that way forever." Yeah. And so, if you if you don't see the change over time, then it's mis then I think you don't have the faith that it will get better. But and also, you know, even if these prices sound cheap um, to us, the I mean, there are many people for they you know they don't have a thousand dollars to buy their home and the knowledge to renovate it. So that's where an OSC like franchise business could step in if you have a mission to improve the affordable housing situation and the knowledge and the money and you don't demand sort of like 10x you know uh, Wall Street or Silicon Valley VC back startup returns if you're okay you know making back you know 10% on your investment or something then I think there's a big opportunity for it. right does Habitat go after properties like that or because Habitat apparently is they're just exploding and building a lot of houses these days uh, they are. They have about written in the French and dormant, but I mean, on paper, they are everything I want to do. They have like a checklist, they have a curriculum, homeowners and classes, and you have to train them. You know, they have to make sure you're able to be a homeowner, and then they'll, get, they'll build a house and give it to you basically for a like, much lower cost or something that's even free. Yeah, the homeowner has to work in the building. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the requirements. No, I think that's a great requirement. The mm -hmm. one in Detroit, I think, is, is dormant. Like, I don't think they're operating a lot of people were hard hit because it's a lower income area so I think they were doing their best just staying at home, sheltering in place, taking care of their family. So there are other cities where I hope Habitat for Humanity is booming because it's a, that's a great organization when I think about The tax sales are really were usually September, August, September. The tax sales were their offices. Yeah, and that's pennies on the dollar. Yeah. Even in North Idaho, where things are expensive, I almost got a place for 10 acres for $10,000. Wow, that's okay. With a creek going through the middle of it. Oh my god, yeah. On, farmland with on-site water is what all the billionaires are buying right now, so. Because they know, yeah, Bill Gates, he's always, he's, his portfolio, his family office is buying a farmland, so. I just offer too low, I offer 2500 <laughs> <laughs> Well, you yeah, gotta, for 10, you gotta see where they're at, you don't know what's coming. I didn't know. What about, um, so is there a lot of light or, or like any crime in that area? Uh, in the area that I bought the house is the one that is like up the cusp of an up and coming. So the first house, Adrian's house, um, it was rough when I first visited in 2019 and now it's much safer and people are building like million dollar mansions like one block away from there. So the new house that I got is like, um, five or six blocks away and it's probably at that stage where it's still a little rough but it's you know easily any time I walk down the street every other house on the street is like renovating and fixing up their house so like that that block is transforming pretty rapidly maybe like once we get like a hundred or a thousand apprentices at a time we can snap up like entire blocks and stuff Did and you just say a thousand apprentices at a time yeah uh, do you do you imagine the apprenticeship program getting that big <laughs> yeah okay yeah absolutely I mean doesn't have to all be here it can be quite distributed but then maybe sure. we can coordinate that and we can do do such crazy things with numbers because it's like it only takes a few good people to shift that around and you know build in a micro factory you only need so much critical mass 
to just completely revive it. You know? Yeah. yeah I mean, you look at the change. Like, so your friend got the land, and you know things are starting to shift already. Yeah. This is it's a wonderful life. I've always been <laughs> that's what it is. Like, remind me, is that, is that movie about? Uh, the movie is that? that. The movie is about one guy who, when he died because he killed himself, yeah. the whole town went to crap instead of prosperity. Okay. Because he had so much effect on making good change. He was a banker guy, giving okay. out people's loans. And, and okay. like the whole town just... You guys know the movie, right? It's a Wonderful mm -hmm. Life? No. Yeah. No. It's Holy cow. It's, it's a Christmas, it's a Christmas movie. movie that's the <laughs> most... The number one oh, Christmas yeah. movie of all times. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the while, most famous... It. No. Yes, but it's exactly it. that, man. Well, I'm pretty sure I got it. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. <laughs> watch it. Yeah, movie night. Yeah. I didn't know it was about real estate and banking. Well, <laughs> so actually, the, interestingly, the guy work. was, like, he built a whole whole community because he gave a lot of people loans for land. Like, okay. when we watched it the next, you know, we watched it several times. Okay. Bef yeah. yeah, and before, like, we kind of missed, wow, this guy's actually doing what we're doing. Yeah. He's reviving in, you know, whole regions. It's Jimmy whole Stewart, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. It's the same, it's, uh, that's what, that's what happens. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He's a general purpose nice guy who makes a lot of change and then the whole community supports him and at the end he got in trouble and then the whole, whole community basically bailed him out. So it's one of those sweet stories, you know? Yeah, he was building um, his own retirement plan. So. Yeah. Well, that's the main... Thanks for listening to my spiel. Um, that's the main um, entrepreneurial idea I came there with. Sort of my purpose in learning CEB and um, the seed home. In relation to the SBIR thing, we should apply for that and take the CEB to product that we can be cranking that out as viable businesses anywhere. So you and many others can reduce the cost of your building. Do the sweat equity thing. Yeah, if there's a program where people can learn how to build their own homes, or just like a habitat, like you have to help two people mm -hmm. build their homes before you get to get your own home built mm -hmm. by the organization. I think that would be a way to take it forward. Because otherwise, you know, many people have poo-pooed um, this approach before, because they said like, oh, like, how are you going to pay for labor? Like, you can't always get dependent volunteers to come up and swarm. Um, like they're saying, the swarm approach is like not sustainable, and you can't keep doing it. Um, so well-intentioned people. Like, um, I talked to a guy at Midwest Earth Builders, which is one of their CEB company. And he, you know, he's seen you at conferences and, and things, and he said, you know, his concern about the whole approach that he didn't think that we could afford to pay for labor, but since he was a building company, you know, it's like in his interest, you know, that's his livelihood, so he, he's not going to be trying to scale down the cost of labor. I mean, that's like, that's... Um, I think the machines could take care of that. The number one cost is the earth preparation. Yeah. And if you have the mixer, which is what we're releasing, different story. And in Belize, we showed that if you have a bunch of people, yeah, you can do that. I think the machine can, if you have that process well worked out, this is the complete engineering question. It's like when we built the first uh, very old workshop here, it took us a long time, and we actually ended up loading the machine with buckets. You know, that was the small brick press. Now we moved up, so we got the production part super efficient. Then the next part is the laying part, you know. But that you can make very efficient also. And we've been exploring those techniques for how to do it. And I want to see the CD go home at comparable price with CEBs. That's, our, that's my promise to the world. Uh, so I'd like to see that as soon as next year. If, if the CEB product takes off, I think that will speak for itself. But the, the supporting machine, yeah, that's, that's like a, it's a big deal because otherwise it's very expensive. I mean, those machines are quite expensive. Nobody can afford it. So, so like the Midwest, Midwest Earth Builders, they don't have any of those machines. They're kind of doing, um, doing the hard way. They, uh, I guess the biggest press method we use is from AECT, Advanced Earth Construction Technologies, and their uh, machine, which produces you know eight bricks per minute, the the six inch by twelve inch brick. That one costs 
eighty thousand dollars, basically. So that's you know that's one you mentioned. That's like four times as expensive as what the OSCE press would cost. And then for the much larger brick size up, it was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something. So I think that's what most people use. I think that's why the Midwest brick builders they use that commercial machine as well. Do they have the the mixer part? Because that's that's absolutely critical, man. But that part. That's, that's why we're not building popping houses left and right. It's up the, right now. The mixer problem. We don't have a mixer. <coughs> that is the soil handling is the problem. It's not like um, can you like the first thing was can the machine make block? That was the first solution. Well, I found yeah, we got like ten out of the first, well six on the first manual machine. Yeah. And I was hoping for three, so we doubled that, and then got to ten with the automatic machine. That is not the issue. Production is not the issue. Per minute. Um, ten per minute. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on 50 horsepower using the Life Track 1 that had a 50 horsepower engine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that is not the issue. So, um, I think that's the kind of thing we got to bring to the world because, like, the other guys, their focus is not, you know, like ACT. Like, I don't, yeah, they, they do talk about, you know, affordable housing, but it certainly is not. I mean, it's, it's legacy housing right now. So, that's something we can definitely change. Uh, definitely. So, um, you know, and Frank Gilbert? Cheaper by the dozen? No. The, the movie? Mm. He was a bricklayer who he timed everything and he was a father of the industrial engineering. Is it a true story? It's a true story. Okay. You, can, you can watch the movie and you can read the books. But efficiency of laying bricks led to industrial engineering. Right. Uh, what's what's the name? Uh, Frank Gilbreth, G I L. G-A-L? G-I-L B-R-E-T-H I thought it was Taylor. Taylorism. Uh, you can <laughs> cheaper by the dozen. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a book and movie? Mm -hmm. Cheaper by the dozen. Yeah, and that's all he made a brick player, right? Like it's not, it's not yeah, like he was just a regular brick player. It's not uh, mechanized. For no. He just started out when he studied uh, motions. So that was it's all about that. It's the industrial engineering. And he he was obsessed with, with time and motion studies. So he had he had his kids uh, tonsils pulled to study the time of motion and then come to find out the cameraman had the lens cap on the camera. Well, yeah, a lot of kids to try Yeah, 12 kids. So. I'm super concerned about that motion. That's why I ever gave every one of you a time lapse camera. <laughs> <laughs> we can study that quite a bit. Yeah, it, it really is that man. My experience has been so uh, so crazy on that. It's it's insane how you can optimize. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's insane. It doesn't stop, and it stops at full automation. Oh, Mark, in which can case, you, uh, unmute yourself now. I muted myself. It's, like it's crazy how much you can do with with efficiencies. Uh, that's been our experience. And that's why right now we can even talk to you with confidence saying, oh yeah, we can crank this, we can do it, it can be excellent, because we know that that can be done and the limit of it is full automation, like say we say we get to the pre printing part or, or other things where, other, other aspects of how we can do it. Um, maybe like we mentioned about those 3D printed forms that are filled with earth, maybe that's another way. There's WikiHouse that does their thing, but then wood panels are very expensive so unless you make your own wood panels like out of straw board then you still got very expensive industrial feedstocks that are not particularly sound uh, always so yeah uh, anyway lots lots could, could be done there it's it's really like like boxable or others they're, they're just kind of making these processes industrial and not to not to make them dumb and like cold just I mean from our perspective we want to make these things accessible so we move on beyond Scarcity so opportunity right now with the machines that we make is sawmills. Right now, yeah. if you order a sawmill, it's one year out before you because they're so backed up. Yeah, actually, I'm, so if if we were I found out, yeah, if we were making sawmills, oh, yeah. we would have a market for it. Processing yeah. our own. Yeah. Um, Even other people sell them. Right? Sawmills no, sell them. You manufacture them, sell them. Would they? Would people bring their raw lumber to us? So Jeff them? says. No. No, you can build a machine. Sawmill. Uh, yeah, because I was actually thinking, since the lumber was so high, now it's dropping. I, was, I actually looked at sawmills to see how much we can get fresh lumber from a sawmill from. It was actually cheaper than the store. 
typically it's more expensive but then okay how about a sawmill so we can actually cut some right now from various lumber from one side like there's trees that fall down we can take out some just a few to do the re regenerative uh, forestry here but um, mm -hmm. it's it's a definite it's one of the machines uh, it's mm -hmm. still there we're gonna build a small CNC version of it that's 20 feet uh, 15 12 to 15 foot feet long if we get the chance for that in uh, the crazy machines week of summer X the, the two two crazy machine weeks of summer X you put a, a hydraulic motor with a blade on the CNC gantry that's all uh, so it's an oversized machine like the 3d printer just a little larger with our little rebar trusses so uh, that's yeah we'll, we'll do a first prototype of that first run of that um, mm -hmm. at the worst you can just put like a you know like even a skill saw and you can make that go CNC and that in itself like if you can you can cut like uh, you can for example take a board and slice it up into our strips that we're doing that which would actually save us a bunch of time mm -hmm. you know okay ripple you know take uh, a machine which takes you feed it the wood and just rips it maybe just lay them out all at once or yeah any, Paul Wheaton has one things like that that he purchased that I haven't seen available anywhere now and it's solar power yeah sure sure whichever power electric, you like uh, electric mm -hmm. saw for making lumber so who wants to go next as far as dark crazy business ideas or or just a throwdown of uh, possibilities here Odundo you yeah. want to go so my main idea is really the 3D forms for rammed earth. That's what I'm obsessed with. Um, I wanted to uh, focus on construction mm. that's uh, using natural materials and huh. uh, getting away from some of the more toxic materials that are more common in construction. Are you uh, muted or not? Make sure if you're speaking, you I'm, unmute. I think. I should be unmuted. Okay. Can people hear me? Anyway, it says I'm unmuted. So okay. That's that's what I'm I'm looking forward to. I don't have huh. any uh, uh, um, prototypes or whatever, but um, I am curious to hear feedback on what people think. Some of the obstacles to something like that, because it seems. Oh, so uh, it seems like sound went out again, man. Uh, let's. You want to? Brian says sound went out. <coughs> Brian says sound went out. Let me refresh. Yes. We want to look into something else than Jitsi. Jitsi's kind of acting up. It says that. Um, Maybe we go to. I can hear you now. I think you oh, now. just moved away from the mic. Okay. It's okay. Now, now it's working. Matt says. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Okay. People can hear me. It's not saying. It's not showing my sound over here. But anyway. Um, yeah, they say they say they can. So speak loud too. So anyway, yeah, I'm I'm looking for feedback on what people think are some of the obstacles to um, using 3D molds for rammed earth. Um, because I haven't really uh, done too much skunk work while I've been here um, to kind of uh, get the ball rolling there. But yeah, that's that's the main thing that I'm uh, focused on at the moment. Well, I love rammed earth. Um, you know, it's, I prefer to compress earth brick just because um, I don't know if you, I've seen people aesthetically. Uh, I feel like you can people have built two-story structures or sort of larger structures and arches, mm -hmm. and uh, anything you can do with concrete, um, you can do with with rammed earth, right. with, like similar molds. And I see the most people, and anyone can do it. Yet. There are usually ways of people doing it in uh, countries where all they have is jungle and hand tools. Uh, and I see them do it with wooden forks that they clamp into place. And if you want to build like a eight-story wall, you know, you just have like a ton of forms, and there are people manually assembling them, and then tamping down, and then um, disassembling them. Yeah. So. To do it in a scalable way, I think something like the insulated concrete forms, like you have um, yeah. Lego, Lego blocks that you can put yeah. together in the shape that you want, and then you basically pour your soil and 
attempt at a maybe mechanizing staff part. Yeah, that's the inspiration actually, because it already does like it's already engineered, so you can even like study what they're using as ties. Because it's so, well, like those forms, they're like styrofoam thing, something, but they're strong enough to hold concrete. So somehow they figured out how to make something that is lightweight but very resilient and outfitted. That's probably the challenge you are facing. Um, would be that, I, I think that would be a good like, case study just to analyze. My yeah. challenge analysis on that is once again, huge amount of soil moving. Yeah. So I've done earth bags, I've done CB, I've done cordwood, yeah. huge amounts of soil moving. So just get yourself a tractor and you're fine. That's fine. But you need some heavy machines to do this. Like this is, right. unless you're, this is like one, one off. If you want, if you're going to go into production tractor or some kind of a thing like a, like a hammer mill like device, which has a chute and that whacks it and just spits it out into the wall. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of work otherwise. So, but that's yeah. easy. That's not a problem but you're gonna have to so there's capital involved in that so big yeah. machines that if you log to your site you have to have enough earth where are you gonna get that earth on the site you can dig out a pond but the volumes of earth are, are intense mm -hmm. the, the cbs weigh two tons per four foot section right now our panels weigh a hundred pounds for a four foot section a lot of weight right. so that's the bottom line there and yeah. Yeah. You could if you have a basement. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also, that's one of the reasons why I was interested in uh, what you were saying about geopolymers. Um, because obviously one of the ingredients that they're going to mix the earth with is uh, possibly concrete. And if we can make concrete also, then, yeah. then it becomes a more sustainable product. Um, so, I mean, these are all things that I've been thinking about. So I, I look at it immediately and say the appliance that makes concrete, it's not a big deal. It's just heat plus an appliance that could be as large as a, like an oven, like a pizza oven kind of a thing. You need a bunch of energy from solar, which is near free. That would be a great SBIR grant. So here you make distributed concrete and it's from lime. Lime, lime concrete does exist. You do want to mix something else with it to make it bind more, but there's a little bit of uh, distributed development, like a distributed enterprise development involved in that because nobody studies that like how do you do distributed concrete production no they just take trucks of rocks in those places it's centralized highly centralized and all that mm -hmm. but in, in history in England like every town had its own cement mill cement plant they were burning limestone everywhere mm -hmm. right so now we have the technology to do it efficiently and and without wiping out the entire tree line <laughs> tree you know all your forests yeah. go solar now so that's I think that's it's one of those things it's like especially like in disaster zones or war zones reconstruction you don't want to wait for the the man to bring your concrete over you got it right there under your feet it's called limestone um, or gypsum rock limestone is around probably like I think like three quarters of the world has it under their feet here we have plenty of limestone that's what the gravel roads are we can be doing that right now so cool um, yeah. that's that's, I mean, it sounds all hairy, but there's nothing to it. It's just heat plus, like a conveyor belt, a Cantal heater. Cantal is a high temperature heater element that goes up to like 1200 C. It's like a pizza. It's an advanced pizza oven. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. um, so there it is. Um, but nothing? Nobody's done it uh, on a small I've scale. I've got a bunch of pictures to share with you. Because it's man, less efficient. Yeah. Like I, I, I took a tour of the southwest a few a few months ago mm -hmm. and I came across this and I got the guy to explain it to me. Oh, nice. So I got build pictures of when he was building it. Thousand cool. dollars for a one room house. Oh. This, uh, he didn't have the right soil so he just ordered road base. Yeah. And then used road base to build it. Right. So solar concrete. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everyone will go freak out over that. Yeah, solar, power power solar concrete. Yeah. Where do you get the electricity to burn this rock? So I'm talking the standard way is you burn fossil fuels to get the heat mm -hmm. to burn this rock. 
Here you can have a more controlled process with heater elements that run on electricity. Where do you get the electricity? Yeah, uh, from a, like a you know here 20 kilowatt panel on a workshop. We're producing enough block like that over a month. We're making enough concrete for an entire house. Yeah. From like a from our workshop roof. We run that when we're not running the other machines because it's like you always have the sun. Maybe some days you're off, so it's a great sideline business. Okay, I'm gonna bake me some rock today because I'm not doing production. So you always use your energy that you have in an ample supply. Oh hell yeah! So I heard that concrete has so a high that carbon just carbon. yeah has a high carbon footprint it's because of the heating, like burning. It's because you're bur burning fossil fuels to heat it. That's okay. the, that's what they do here. It's a solar carbon neutral. This is revolutionary. This is a, this class, this would be a trillion dollar industry. Just like the recycled plastic homes, that's another trillion dollar industry. Yeah. So is there a way to make a, a roof from solar panels that seals off? <laughs> well, it's exactly what I designed it about a week ago. Yeah, oh, yeah we got that. Sick. We were going to do it. We were going to, we're, we're going to do that. Uh, I'd like to do that for the kitchen. It's experimental. We've never built it. So I, I suggest that the, we haven't gotten to the kitchen there yet, but if we do it, let's make a 16 by 16 structure that's got a roofless roof. Mm -hmm. How's that sound? We like removing parts from the things we build. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. build a roofless roof. Is that gonna with solar panels? Watertight. Okay, watertight. Watertight uh, protects against hail and. Yeah, the panels right. are rated for like hurricanes and huge yeah, hail, okay. hail chunks. Panels yeah, do pretty good at hail. Okay. Well, <laughs> so, uh, so Google roofless yeah. roof on the wiki, and you'll find it. You'll find the design. It's, in, it's under the architecture part library. I was specking that out. So actually, the Joshua appears from Michigan Tech. He's also done some design on that. Um, I don't think he's got something like us. I don't know if he has. He's, I think he had a concept. I don't think he had an actual design. Um, but yeah, cool stuff. Next person, please, on enterprise ideas. Could I ask you? What's the difference between class? So questions here. So we've got one question from Ken here and Matt. You have to. So the question is. What's the difference between round earth? Uh, difference between rammed earth and, and CB yeah. is that the CB is packed into a brick. Rammed earth, you don't have a, a machine that packs it. You you tamp it into a form. There's forms that you have to make. So the form making is a massive process. That's a lot of hardware, a lot of steel and wood or whatever. If you 3D print those forms, that's great. Then you just leave it, low labor like insulated concrete forms. Very good. Yeah, does that make sense? Uh, both are, I think, I, I really like that. I, I do like that idea. I didn't really think much about that, but yeah, yeah. That's a perfect thing for trash, trash plastic, man. Yeah. And then you put a nice skin on it, make plants grow on it or something, your, your aquaponic towers <laughs> right on your walls. That'll be great. Uh, Matt, what's your question? Strong clay, as I've mentioned a few times. And uh, so from an insulation value, am I right that uh, like cob or anything else, the rammed earth wouldn't have inherently a high insulation value? Uh, you have thermal mass. Uh, have, right, well, it's just thermal mass, but not insulation. Because I, I wonder if like adding something like straw in there somehow, you know, how can we... Because I keep on getting hung up on insulation. I, I, I just want to stay away from, you know, the the typical kind of foam insulation, if where possible. And, and yeah, so I'm just wondering so, how we could integrate that. Yeah, three D print that. So mul uh, multiple, like multi cell glazing, like polycarbonate, you make it up to like four walls thick. Make a large cell number, like ten or twenty layer three D print that's built into that form, and you could get some good insulation. So we haven't done that. Uh, but it's about if you've got the layers, it's all about air motion. So conduction is how most, I think most heat loss comes through conduction. So if you 3D print multiple layers, how do you minimize conduction? You make the connections between each layer, just a little point here and there, enough to make it structural. But you can, that's what 3D printing lends itself to. You can do complex geometry, so why not print a multi-cell structure with the 3D printers that has insulating property? So if you probably Google it, like I Googled uh, 3D printed insulation, I didn't find much. But this is like polycarbonate multi-wall glazing as a start. Those things have like 
it's like I think like R1 per cell like the the four cell is already R4 just make more and you're fine and R10 R20 R20 is what we have to compete with here we'd have to do 20 cells but each cell could be probably like a millimeter <laughs> so you can have uh, I think the limits are to be explored here yeah. as far as what can be done nobody's done that nobody's thinking along these lines there you do your free. that I've heard yeah aircrete is another hempcrete I mean they, they're making hemp hempcrete insulation. Papercrete. the problem is if your house gets on fire well, people downwind are going to get stoned have to sneak that in I mean, we always we always say that at our house because <laughs> everyone loves hempcrete <laughs> alright um, next person please uh, feedback on what you think are business opportunities I love this rammed earth stuff, man. Ken, t talk about your business opportunity. Ken from yeah. Indonesia. Um, I I was uh, actually thinking of starting. Um, Unmute. Oh, sorry. It should be good. It should be good. I, I, I was thinking about um, uh, starting, starting uh, 3D, 3D printing, 3D printing. 3D, uh, making, uh, making 3D, 3D printers, printers. So, so making and selling 3D printers and also having a, like a 3D printing file. So, um, uh, so that, that was just the start that I was thinking of. But I was also thinking about, I mean, I've always been interested in um, CDs, uh, making, building using CDs. Um, especially CDs, earth blocks stabilize with, with uh, cement, you know, to withstand rain. So, so I, so I was actually thinking, thinking about a company, about a company with a different, with a different um, business, business unit. So you'd, so you'd have, have one like uh, for for, for um, uh, building for, for, for making, making buildings, buildings uh, uh, using you know the CB press. Then you, then you could have, have a business unit doing making 3D printers. printers. You could have an uh, agricultural unit um, using, uh, I mean, all of these would be using open source uh, uh, machines, you know. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the way I was thinking. And Ken's not only thinking about what he's already doing, he's, just, he's built a couple of printers, he got a, a D3D Pro, and then he built, he built another. Did yeah, you do yeah, another, another pro? Or? Yeah, the, the 12 inch. Yeah, so he yeah, built so the larger 12 inch from the 8 inch. That's cool. He's bootstrapping to larger machines. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's that's pretty encouraging because that's the farthest anyone abroad has ever gotten. I mean, I don't know anybody else who's actually got that clear intent to, to actually go forward with it. And he's a proud recipient of the Shuttleworth $5,000 grant that I nominated him for. So he's going to succeed. We're going to help him succeed. Um, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. So uh, who wants to go next? Hi, I'm Todd. So there's Wes. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I mean, I think, you know, I want to see housing be a, a solved problem. Because my passion is not really housing. Um, I, I just want to live with a bunch of indie game developers and, and work on creative art projects. Some of the, I guess, aspects that we've worked on so far I'm interested in is maybe like recycling plastics or or, uh, or bioplastics. That, that kind of seems like it has a lot of potential to me. And I also think one thing is that um, I don't think the world will ever get to widespread open hardware adoption without without a lot of money behind it. Um, like there are there are a lot of companies with strong incentives to 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 fight against open source. One example is like Apple not uh, depreciating OpenGL and not supporting Vulkan. Uh, that's an example where you know a company is like 
intentionally sabotaging an open source project to try and like um, to get developers to work on a pr proprietary platform, a proprietary hardware platform. Um, so I think the earning a lot of money is important uh, to fund these projects. And I also think that it's really hard to earn a lot of money no matter no matter what. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been studying the models for open source um, software enterprise, and there's mainly like three. There's uh, Open Core, where you have a main set of software, and then uh, you can provide additional services or uh, a newer a newer branch that people will pay for. Um, you can provide services like Red Hat. You can provide, um, or or you can. Uh, like host your software on the cloud for other people to use, and those are from from all of my research on open source software. Um, those are the only ones I found. But there are in practice a couple others, like Godog just raises money on Patreon, and uh, like so like crowdfunding is is one. Um, but I don't think crowdfunding is ever going to be like um, it's it's not going to get scale. It's not like it's never gonna get to scale it, because the best projects, even like Blender, they have nowhere near the budget of enterprise software. Um, hmm. So and, and you know Blender has taken like decades to develop. So not only does it not have very much money, but it also took you know decades to get to the point where it had some money. Hmm. Uh, I think it would be bad if it took decades to get a lot of funding to towards open source. So I think whatever we do has to be fast. How much do you think a lot is? Like, you know, how much do you... Um, well, so, so my goal, like, long term is, like, I the idealized future I see is um, providing a path for every every game developer in the world uh, to, to become an indie game developer and to travel around the earth freely without, without worrying about housing or any other bill, just, just being able to wander. I, I, want, I want people to be able to wander. So that, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's not so much money, it's, it's uh, giving people physical autonomy. I, I don't uh, I, I want uh, the latest I want the latest computer uh, and that's what I need for, for my work so that's like my 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 biggest besides that's but like that's a very small expense compared to housing mm -hmm. I can you know a computer a, the highest end computer it costs me you know less than a thousand dollars a year rent rent costs me seven hundred and fifty dollars a month you know, and that's if I'm sharing with roommates and stuff. Um, my ideas are maybe uh, a few, like one, Dundo has talked about this, is um, enabling small businesses to use open source hardware. I think that has a lot of potential. And it's focusing on actually helping companies save money. In, instead of trying to be an enterprise, we just focus on reducing the operating margins of existing commercial em companies. I think that's a potential avenue for generating profit through open source. Yeah. And then the other one is, I think we need a better platform for open source hardware, because I don't think GitHub is very uh, good at, at, or we don't have any collaboration tools for open hardware that are competent. That's my, that's my opinion. And I think it's the same, pr uh, same problem with game development. We don't have any really good game engines, and I think th there are many like overlapping issues that I can contribute to. And it's just a matter of like choosing what's the most important to work on. Mm -hmm. um, Wes, did you take notes from that conversation we were having before yep. about that would be good? Can you pump them into this doc if you want? Alright. Um, 
when you talk about reducing operating margins for companies, what do you think that could be in, in terms of a product? Like, what any specific, or just a, that's a general comment? Because that, yeah, that's that's good. That's how I look at it too. It's like we're going to reduce their operating costs. Like, okay, here, use this. You you make more money. Amazon, yeah. use our open source micro factory, make more money because you don't have to <laughs> buy it from right. <laughs> from uh, your suppliers. I guess uh, when I when we were talking about that, what we were thinking about was the uh, um, any product that has planned obsolescence is what we want to go after, um, and specific. We also want to go after. Um, industries where the technology hasn't changed a lot. Um, oh, like tractors. Yeah, <laughs> like tractors yeah. and um, and CB presses. Uh, even appliances. I, I keep mm. coming back to that. Oh um, yeah. If <laughs> I don't know if anybody's looked into how expensive it is to uh, put together a food truck, but uh, it's it's pretty expensive, and uh, mm. you've got uh, postings on. Um, uh, Craigslist for food trucks going for over a hundred thousand um, dollars. There's a lot of room there food trucks. for you to <laughs> swallow up some of that margin. Um, mm. So yeah, uh, things like that. Uh, those were basically what we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, who wants to go next? I can go. Uh, Joshua. Hey, I want you. There we go. And one, and one. Yeah, it's coming through. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my main motivation for coming here was. Uh, I mean, obviously money is important and it's it's crucial to any project to have money, but um, mainly to see if I can use the hardware and use what I've learned here to build first, initially to build an eco-village or an intentional community around um, just people <laughs> getting off grid, um, unjobbing, I, I like that idea here. And then everyone works together to support each other and to work toward solving the problems, like the pressing world issues that are listed on the wiki. Um, you know, I, I I agree with that mindset and the, that mentality. So um, my my first steps are really to look for a place to to begin that at, and then begin to build infrastructure and work with the network of, of people that I've, I've met here to accomplish that. Also reaching out to other intentional communities that are already started and have um, you know, have already become more or less self-sufficient as well. So that's, that's really it. Am I still muted? Yeah. I think we could hear you. All right. Mm -hmm. And what do you think as the... So that's the enterprise you'd like to start upon, like get working on it when you finish here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So also, I see the, the collaboration and the, the network is more important than, than the money. The money, you know, as long as you have a product, as long as you can provide some value to someone, which OSE can, then I think you'll, then I think the needs will be met, but getting more people along with the mindset and being able to get people that are dedicated to other causes outside of just working is, is the way to really make larger changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. How about Prince? Do you have any ideas of the life after? Yeah. <laughs> I think I should be good. Uh, the biggest two were mostly like um, construction and agriculture. Um, I don't think I can be what Paul said, but definitely something along the lines of that since um, 
run from the day against houses that are pretty high right now, probably the highest they've ever been. Um, so that's definitely something that needs addressed in this. But then um, in agriculture, I checked maybe over the last year or two, there's like one CSA in the city um, with a population of over like half a million people. So that's one small farm, like on a quarter of an acre, that you know can really supply all the people who want healthier options. And then thinking about like the closed loop um, greenhouse system where water's already like not abundant there. So water you do have you can reuse and keep and can you know continue to produce food for that community um, when there's not a lot of it really going on. So those are kind of the two things that I was interested in. Do you see a clear revenue model coming out of any of these? Yeah, I was looking at them. So that CSA, they have you two options. Like a smaller bundle, there's a certain amount of food that you get delivered to you on a weekly basis for $25 a month. There's a bigger one, which is maybe double the amount of food for 50 And they had a cut off at some point as to just how much they could produce, which I think was maybe at around 100 people. So I mean, at the bare minimum, if just everyone doing the $25 little bundle option at 100 people, that's you know $8,000 a month on quarter acre farm just producing you know vegetables and eggs and that was it. So and imagine that you know 10 times the, 10 times the size of that on a bigger lot with the ability to you know accommodate more than 100 people for you know around the same price. You could, I guess, you know, go as big as you could, as big as you wanted it to go, but, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's that's definitely good. Like, I, I'd like to see something like that here where we're, we're doing that too. I'd like to see it. And then also think about autonomous vehicles that could deliver that. So maybe we can contribute to that. Yeah. Because then you d you're taking out all your travel time and that's yeah. good. That was the thing too, like they were having issues with where trying to schedule that in because people would be on one, t one part of the alley and someone would be on the other and I think they said, you know, it takes, they only have a certain amount of drivers and it takes their drivers mm -hmm. all day to deliver those, the food. Um, and, you know, it's so hot up there that they put everything, you know, like little, um, like reg deal regulated bags with like little ice packs and if you're on the wrong side of town, by the time they drop off your food, everything's melted, everything's warm. You know, it's not as fresh as it was at 6 o'clock in the morning when they're delivering it. When it's cool outside, you're getting it at 4 p.m. when it's 110. And it's like, oh, that's not really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that they you can just start delivering at 2 a.m. Yeah, that too. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Start knocking on the door. Here it is. That would have helped. But yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I think there's clear models there. It requires some efficiency and then some staff and support and tech. I think know how. Is, uh, to learn that effectively and share that openly. Um, the people who are really good at it, they don't tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Jeff, how about you? What do you think? I need to lift. Mm -hmm. well, well, I am very, very interested, interested in, in um, affordable, affordable house. house. That's something, That's something I have researched and studied, and studied and spent money, spent money on, on to figure, to figure out, out for a long, for a long time. time. Uh, I, just, uh, I just before, before I came, I came here, here just a few months ago, ago I took a trip two for weeks two weeks and went across, went across uh, New, Mexico New Mexico and Colorado, Colorado and looked at looked houses and houses housing options. And, uh, and, in and in the past, past I've gone to Italy, Texas, and looked at monolithic domes and that David, David South, South was doing, and studied, studied his, his thing. thing. I like, I like the, model the model that he had. That he so, had. so most of most my, of my life, life I've been poor. Been poor. So, uh, so uh, being, uh, being poor, housing, housing is, is a big, big problem. problem. And then, and then so, that so that was something that I was always interested in: is how to help a poor person. I've I don't know if, I don't know if any of you have read, read the book, book Nickel and Diamond. And and it's, it's, a it's a book about, about um, what's that? What's that? Barbara yep. Yep. Now she's, uh, she's got several books. I've, I've, yeah, that's, one uh, that's one of them. So, so, so anyway, so anyway uh, it's a story, it's about, a story how about how the uh, a 
a person, uh, a person working, working in a fast, in a fast food, food joint, how in the world, how do, they world do they make it? You know, you know, it's just, it's almost, just impossible. almost impossible. And, and, they, and get they get stuck in this, get stuck stuck in this and rut, and I've been stuck in that rut before. before. Even, Even though I have skills and abilities and and all of that, I've just been stuck. I was in a situation where I couldn't get out of it no matter how hard I, 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 I did get out of it, but it took a while. It didn't, it didn't happen in a few in months or even a few years. So, so I feel for people like that. And I looked at what David South did. So I mean, I look at the housing projects. I've lived in the housing project, and people trash the place. You know, they there's no there's no appreciation for it. I don't really want to help somebody like that. I want to help somebody. That's, that's helping themselves, helping themselves you, know. you know and I, and I, uh, I looked at David, David South, South. So David, so David South, South he took, he took and, and he made affordable, he made affordable housing. housing his units cost about $30,000 a piece and this was uh, probably, uh, probably 15 years 15 ago it was $30,000 $30, for, for a, a, unit. a unit and he rented, and he rented it out for $140, $140 a week, a week all paid. bills paid that's that's what is that? What is that? Two eighty five five hundred sixty dollars a month. So somebody, so somebody working, working a minimum, a minimum wage, wage job, job, they could they could just get by, by on that, on that and, they and, and they could have nice, nice safe, safe, decent decent housing. housing. So, so I looked at that model. How large? Like uh, it was it was in it a, was in a, a studio. studio. So uh, the the. Uh, uh, the bedroom, the bedroom and the living room was one, room and, the was one and the same. So you, so you, you walked in, in and, and, uh, and immediately, immediately when you walked in, there's, in, there's a, 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 a couch that made, made into a, a bed, and there's a kitchen, and, there's a kitchen and, a, and, a, and a two place two table, table, and then there's, and then there's a, a walk in closet and a and a bathroom with a shower room. Not real big, I think 250 square feet or so. But he solved the problem with. So, so I have run, I have into, run people into people in my life, in my life that, that they make their, their one of their one of their the ways, the ways that they, they make, they it, in make the it in the world is they go is from they go place from place to place. They pay the deposit, they move, they move in, in, and then they, and then they don't pay another thing, thing until, until they are physically, are physically evicted. evicted. Sometimes and sometimes with all the laws, laws and things, that might be a year or two. And then, and then they just the go to the next and they just, and they just continue oh, and until, until they wear out their, 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 their options in their area and then they move to another area. area. But then they're, they're, they're not the only, only ones doing that. There's a lot of people doing that. So, so how do you get around that? That was one one thing is like if I've got a place, I have to pay for it. So how would I how would I do this? And I wanted to make money at it, but I won't I don't I don't need to make need to make a killing. I just want to make enough so I can no, I can live, I can live and, I can and I can continue to, to replicate this. this. So what, so David, what David South, South did, did is he did, is he did extended, extended stay, stay motels. motels. So so uh, they were small, uh, they were small they're units. Keyed. They're keyed. If somebody doesn't, if somebody pay, doesn't pay, suddenly they don't. Suddenly they don't just, they, like motel, just like a motel, you can't, you can't get in the door no more. more. You know. So there's so there's and there's different rules for extended stay motel. I mean, sure you can be compassionate and all if someone is. Is truly, is truly having a, a, problem. a problem, but if someone, but if is, someone taking is taking advantage, advantage it's, it's much much, much, easier, much easier to to move them to move out, them out rather than rather than being under the, the, the typical rental, rental rules, rules for real real estate. Real estate. Mm. So so I like that, I like that aspect, aspect of it. Of it. But, the but the problem was was, was in order in order to, to get into the bottle of the dome business. You've got to have a You've got to have a fifty thousand dollar spray rig, spray rig for urethane, urethane foam, foam. And, a, and, a, and another and another uh, the concrete, uh, the concrete pump, pump is twenty five thousand. So you're so you're by the time you're, the time you're all set up, all you're, set up you're a hundred thousand dollars into the equipment. And I didn't and see, any, I didn't see any easy way to to make a pluralistic concrete, concrete pump. pump. Uh, I, 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 I did look into that. So and then concrete and then concrete itself is. Is not a cheap not a cheap thing if you're thing using, if you're solid, using concrete. solid concrete. And the foam and the foam. I mean the foam, I mean, the foam is five thousand dollars for for a for a, a, a fifty five gallon, gallon barrel. So, so you got two you got two part A and part B, part a and, part B 
And if you don't, and if you don't use it all up, it goes bad. So it's, so it's, kind, it's of a, kind of a dog eat dog world on that, on that with using that. Using that. And, and you, you let it set you up. Let it set up all your equipment's all your ruined. Equipment's ruined. <laughs> you're, 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 you're pumping, pumping concrete, concrete and, 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 and something goes, goes wrong. wrong. Your engine, your engine breaks, breaks and you can't get it going. Suddenly, you've got concrete hoses and that was just $25,000 down the drain, you know. $50,000 down, down the drain. So anyway, so anyway I've, I've looked at other methods, other methods to, to, do to do that. So, so the CEB, the CEB press, was press was one that I, that I, I looked at. And I, I, I like the, the CEB, CEB press. press. I like, I like panelized, panelized construction, construction because of the speed, of the speed and, and, all of that. and all of that. But, but with the price, with the price of lumber right now, right now that, that can be a problem. Whereas the CEB press... You can you can, can get around can that. Get around one, that. Other one other thing I like about C V press is is perhaps selling, perhaps selling a, workshop, a workshop doing the, doing the, showing people showing how, people to, how to use a C V press and they help and they help you build the low the low income housing that you're trying, trying to build. And the house and the house will be, house will be built within walking, within walking distance of where, distance of where the people would work. And then and then after the after the people come to the workshop, to the workshop ideally, ideally people, people from the area, area then you would rent then you would out, out the the C V press, press machine to them to, to them to for them to build their their, their own place. Where they could where they could do a bunch of, do a bunch of things. things. Or it could be a, a, side, a business side business where you hire where you people, people. Perhaps people, perhaps from, people your from your own little community, little community that you've got. So so but that's an but that's idea, an idea that, that I have been kicking around for a long time. The financing is the hard part. That's the that's the Financing for which part? Uh, the financing, uh, the financing of, of, of the uh, the uh, purchasing, purchasing land and, and, uh, and the, materials the materials and paying for, paying for labor, labor and all all of, all of that. So, so even if you do the work yourself, well, I well, could do the work, myself, do the work yeah. myself. Yes, or, yeah, or, yeah. just, just, just more, slowly. more slowly. Yeah. 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 But still, but like, still, like so if I did the, so work, I did myself, the work myself, I'd have, I'd have to. CEB press, CEB press 6,500 6, materials, 10,000 materials, 10, 000 materials. Uh, I don't know what the materials cost, cost all right, right now. It was, it was, but you got the, you got the, the cost, the cost, the cost materials of materials to build it. To build it. And, then and then really, when really it whenever it comes to laying the block, the block you, you, need you need labor. labor. That's, That's, you can do it. You can do it. Yeah, you can do it one at a time. Just sweat equity. Now the other thing I thought of was doing... A machine, a machine that, that, that hooks to a skid, skid steer. So like, so like um, um, in my, in my area, area, there's, there's no, no clay. clay. I've, I've called, called and called and called, called looking, looking for clay, for clay and I have and not been able to find any clay that somebody will sell me. I've heard, I've heard people, people say, oh, there's clay over here, or there's clay over there, but I have not found any that can be delivered by a dump truck to me. So that's a problem. And... I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's if, I get if I get 100 miles out, there's, out, there's got to be clay somewhere, but somewhere, then you, then you got trucking cost to, 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 bring to, to bring it to me. So, so the other thought, the other I, had thought was, I had was what, what is what abundant in my area, in my area sand is sand and gravel. gravel. So, so uh, then you've got, then the, you've got the, uh, 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 the, sandbag the sandbag option. Well, sandbags, well, sandbags, sandbags filling sandbags is very, is very laborious. laborious, but you can but make you a machine, machine that you could, that you could scoop, the sand, scoop the sand and fill the, and fill the sandbags in, 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 time, in time automatically. automatically. So, it so it built that, built that and, then and then you set them on pallets and you had a machine to, 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 that was that strong, strong enough to lift, enough to lift the sandbags and bring them to the, the, spot, the spot where you're, where you're, where you're laying them and then somebody at waist tight just takes and sets them over, then that would... That would, that would help that. on that, but I, but I personally have not built with sandbags, with sandbags unlike, unlike Martin, who, who has, who has and doesn't have any desire to ever do it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Yeah, that, I, I don't see a good case. Or, or the case is there if you work out more cost than labor. That's all. Mm -hmm. So you don't say no. You just say okay. How much is it going to cost? It's going to be more on labor. CB's gold. Still is. Yeah. So regular, like, like, like how do you bond it together? Bond that, together that's that's the part. Did you do uh, wire? Or did you do wire? Simple wire. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, unless they're, yeah, unless they're small, small, then if you they're, they're small, you're paying so much per bag. So you have mm -hmm. to make them heavy. heavy. That is backbreaking back work. work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> well, the, the other <laughs> thing that I saw is there some there is somebody that's developed a machine that that. 
it, it, it looks like, it looks a, like a bucket for a skid steer that has an auger on it, and it, and it, it fills it earth tubes. tubes. So, you so you take a second skid steer and you dump into, into the first one, one and then it augers the material through the, the, tube, the tube, and then it, and then it lays a continuous, and you just back the skid steer up, and it's laying a continuous tube. On the wall, and, and then you've got that, somebody that, that walks along, walks along champing, champing it, and it goes fairly quickly, fairly quickly that way. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. one, it's one, it's one very, very long bag, you know, it's about around. that big around. So you build walls What's that? What's that? Do you build walls yeah, it's a yeah, it's a bag, like a tie bag, like tie bag, bag, and it was you would do the you would do the two strips of bar wire, wire just like what you do with the 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 sandbags, sandbags where you put bar put bar wire down to bite in between, and then and then you would you would stuck a wire the inside and outside and you plaster the stuck on inside and outside to encase it. The bags, the bags, the bags, the bags, the bags, Fairly quickly, fairly quickly. And this, one, and this one down here, down here they're in the, shade. in the shade. But if that, but was, if in that was in direct sunlight, sunlight like, like, those bags go away pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got less than, less than a year, year before, they, before they, they start they start busting on you. On you. Yeah. So, so. For the CB, that you, you can also have a viable product. This is not a product you can sell. It would have to be right. right. So it's a different kind of an enterprise. With the, with the CB, you could you could palletize them and you you load an eighteen wheeler with them and ship, with them, and ship them out. So. That's yeah, that's like a, for example, ACP. I just looked at it. What they sell like a, a pallet for like a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks. They're like a dollar or two. I think like more like two dollars a block. Two forty, I think we're selling them for for a block of dirt. Dirt, block of dirt for two forty. It's stabilized. So you got ten to forty cents of cement in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Katrina, tell Katrina, us about tell your us about your your wildest your dreams regarding <laughs> enterprise that you can see coming out of <laughs> collaborative <laughs> development <laughs> that's, that's brewing. brewing. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the best answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about unprepared How about stuff? stuff? No. <laughs> no. So let's go to Matt. Go to Matt. 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 Oh, okay. Oh, Katrina has one. Has she, one. Does. she does. It's something that we do Like a, like a yurt, 
but it's but it's, it's wood, it's wood, okay. and, uh, and they sell it. They sell it. I can't just like what you're talking about. Where it's, about where it's you can either you can either get it, I think you can get it, you can get it, or you can get it, you can get it in panels. Okay. So, but I think but I think it's Delta. Delta. Delta or Deca? Deca. Deca. Yeah, I think this is it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what this is about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what also helps, like, you know, get a little more room on the whole thing. I know an engineer that, that, that I worked with. He bought them the one, the Deca home. Yes. Yes. And then you can leave the home in the summer. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a coffee. Every, coffee every, every, every bit of time. Bit of time that he did. And, and he had his, had his wife, wife helping him and his father in law. And, 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 and one, one, a few hired people here and there. there but, yeah. but he was yeah. able yeah. to, to yeah. get a roof over his head pretty quickly. So, so. He didn't, he have, didn't have to go to scratch. But he had time to do it that way. Do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, the design, the design. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Let's hear from some of the remote, remote people. Uh, Matt, maybe you want to open up since you piped in already? Sure, yeah. Um, actually, uh, I, I have uh, some notes down at the bottom under integrations between OC and other models. Um, so, uh, so what what I'm doing here and where I'm trying to integrate OSC is um, uh, 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 Jeff. I got you, Jeff. I just muted it. Oh. Okay, there you go. Okay. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Alright. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, you all hear me? Yep. yep. I hear you. <laughs> we hear you. So, um, uh, near the bottom of the document, yeah, uh, see has it. Some notes there. Um, yeah, there it is. Uh, so, we are in the process of starting. A, uh, we have a nonprofit, and we're trying to um, create a space uh, that's uh, kind of it's like, kind of integrates uh, self-directed learning, um, which is also known as unschooling uh, if you're doing it kind of with kids um, just kind of a type of homeschooling but it's child directed um, basically the idea is uh, if we give kids a space uh, in which they can pursue their interests and passions and we have facilitators who can kind of support them in that journey then they can learn what they need to learn in a more uh, meaningful and effective and efficient manner um, and so uh, one aspect of uh, that's common in these spaces is a maker space uh, and so I, that's kind of where I see uh, OSC fitting in uh, as kind of providing this um, kind of uh, kind of much more than a maker space, but, but it would, it would uh, you know if we um, kind of combined like a micro factory um, where we're you know building stuff uh, for revenue generation, and then some of those machines can also be used by perhaps older kids who are trying to experiment with different uh, you know. Uh, businesses or you know, experiments and they could use the space for that and uh, and one of the other aspects I feel like there's a lot of function stacking kind of overlapping that could happen here um, so for example staff could serve as facilitators for um, uh, to kind of support kids as they learn um, while also learning to build themselves and if, if that's kind of a direction they want to go for, for their own um, kind of livelihood. Um, so as they're learning to build, they could also be getting some income at, as a facilitator, or, or maybe uh, the facilitation and the building thing could be things that are done kind of alongside each other, so that when they don't have an active build, they, they have the facilitation um, gig to, to fall back on. Uh, and then, uh, so one of the other benefits that I see from this is if we, you know, if you're a startup and um, you know where do you where are you getting your uh, your revenue from? Uh, and so I think one uh, source could be through uh, you know membership and tuition from community members. Um, and so if if you're kind of new to kind of the OSE building side, you could start by generating some income through that tuition piece. Um, 
and then uh, and then as you kind of get the business side off the ground, that can then support uh, uh, kind of the overall organization. Maybe even allow you to, to decrease tuition and membership, which is our goal. Um, and then uh, and then as you know, the kids and and other you know, for ours it's intergenerational, and so so we actually want um, adults as well to be members who are just kind of pursuing their own interests and, and passions, um, and so creating it would be kind of this incubator space where people can explore um, you have the freedom to, to engage in R&D and, and develop new ideas and new businesses and can test it out and, and find support in that journey um, and uh, and kind of you know identify livelihoods that, that feel good to them um, and that aren't just this typical just uh, toiling uh, behind a desk uh, and something you don't enjoy um, and then ultimately uh, the other key piece is in terms of the, from the long-term perspective, you know, how do we build uh, kind of the next ger generation of OSC builders? Uh, and so I think by providing this software learning space where kids are kind of on a daily basis being exposed to this and kind of swimming in this environment, so to speak, um, you know, not all of them will end up wanting to do this, but uh, but many might, and, and they have a greater appreciation for the potential for them to kind of take control over um, you know technology or housing um, and things like that so so our initial hope is to start with the CD go home um, as kind of a, a kind of a regenerative business that would help generate revenue for the overall nonprofit uh, and then go from there in terms of uh, expanding to other technology so mm -hmm. uh, yeah and and there's also you know networks of these self-directed learning centers and so I, I think it could be really um, like I could see them being kind of early adopters uh, for some of this uh, work we're doing here, and so if, we, if if I can, you know, through ours, kind of prove and kind of give evidence that this model works, uh, I can see other software learning centers wanting to um, try to replicate that. Your goal, right after finishing, <clears throat> Martin, I see you're talking, but I don't hear you. Right oh, after you. finishing, you would uh, you'd look at so getting some clients. Well, as soon as we. Uh, Finish the product and have have it market ready. Would your would you see your goal is okay? You find a client and then do a home for somebody, or would it be for your for yourself first, or how do you look at it? Yeah, uh, um, we have we we, we uh, a year ago moved to an intentional community and we have a, a lot to build on, and so uh, building our own would be the first kind of uh, prototype, and hopefully we could kind of make a workshop out of it and make mm -hmm. it a kind of event for the community uh, but then ultimately yeah our goal is to um, to then offer this as a service um, with a particular focus on uh, uh, accessible affordable housing but then you know if people want to build big stuff uh, elsewhere you know we'll, we'll do that too you know if we have time and space uh, um, but but yeah we're really kind of making affordable housing affordable and accessible um, uh, yeah yeah I've, I've spoken to some uh, some other um, groups around here who are doing this sort of thing, trying to you know work on affordable housing. Um, and uh, when I mentioned you know how much these would cost, like, you know they're, they're, they're just they, they couldn't believe it. You know, um, uh, there's a there's a habitat house, habitat for humanity house that's being built in our community soon, and, and I'm sure it's it's going to be much more than than what we could build our uh, you know an OSC house for. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. So let's let's hear from. Brian, what do you see as the opportunities? Well, I guess I learned something in this conversation. One observation would be that in the same way you have to swarm in order to build a CD eco home in five days uh, with 24 people, you need to swarm around a business model or approach mm -hmm. so it's almost like mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear everybody speak because it's everybody sort of has their own interest which would be less of a swarm uh so i think that's sort of like an open issue uh but the osc model is clearly a educational apprenticeship model um i would like to be able to get um, uh, some sort of educational entity to 
um, make you like a senator of some kind so that you can get, you know, you can both grant, you know, certifications and get, you know, the financial aid and tuition benefits of an existing academic institution. Um, that will bring a lot more people through the doors. Um, and then I would want to do a SIBR and just do SBIR. one document. Yeah. What I was SBIR. calling SBIR. SBIR. He calls it SIBR. That's apparently how they call it. SIBR? Mm -hmm. So um, I just I think that we should pick one and do it. And then if we're, as we learn, we'll understand the dynamics and be able to um, to do it for more products. What I'm out of, uh, I really like what Katarina was saying about the kits. That to me sounds uh, doable. Um, but again, like you, you would have to find a group of people that want to do the same business. You know, that's ultimately, you know, just because everyone, what what we have is a group of people that want to learn a certain amount of content, but I don't know if we have the a group of people that want to build the same business. And in order to really do that, we need to get out of our heads and into uh, conversations with customers in order to, you know, put forth the sales materials and prototype such that we have somebody who will want, you know, we're, we're learning from the market, you know, just like you're learning from things that don't work when you're making a prototype, like in terms of the actual hardware working, it's the same thing related to a customer. So we have to, just because we successfully get the hardware working doesn't mean that people will buy it. So, um, but we all want to, we're all buying it from an educational perspective. Um, so that's, that's a one indicator, but, um, I'm also interested in the, you know, the, the other devices that are selling. I mean, if we were all on board and we really wanted to do it, I think the what I would do is create a co-op or some sort of entity that we all um, can... Um, that entity would be in charge of developing the products in terms of like the marketing materials, the sales, you know, inbounds, you know, getting um, leads and doing all that such that if you do want to be building houses, I mean, that's the question I have. Do people want to be building brick presses and houses for their job, you know, for the next five to ten years? That's what, that's what you're offering, and that's totally fine if people don't, but a business around selling eco-homes is just that. It's selling and building eco-homes, you know? Uh, it's just not a one-off. So I would, I would build, if I were, if we were really doing that, I would build a back office that, you know, you have your builders, but everything around those builders that you would need would be the marketing, the, you know, that would have a really cool design that would get people excited. It would be priced, you know, um, I don't know, online advertising, all the things, mm -hmm. accounting, yeah. all the things that you probably don't want to do. Uh, but it would be a support system for the the builder as their own entrepreneur uh, that you know so that's sort of uh, but I think for now just doing the SIBR and uh, integrating into some of these you know veteran and um, institution academic institutional programs will will uh, be the next stage for the stage will be the next stage of development for where we're at I think I, I would see uh, yeah I'm curious about the if anybody wants to be prototyping products in conversations with customers to me that's the most important thing the the, the riskiest assumption is that we build something and we can't sell it so, how do you do that? We would. How do you process um, customers? So, what's that process look like? Um, 
Well, uh, there's lots of ways to prototype it, but um, I think that um, PM. what we I would start with a javelin board, which is like a, a tool that allows you to basically come up with a hypothesis. Like this customer has this, you know, you identify the customer, you identify the problem, and you have a hypothesis that that is true, that, you know, they th this type of person says they have this type of problem, and you would test that. You would actually talk to seven and say, my hypothesis, if it is correct, it would be like seven out of ten people have to oh, uh, say that this is their problem. And if if you don't validate that, then you're wrong. Oh, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. So then you would change your problem or your customer, and you would do that until you get it right. Or and then you your, would change your product too, right? Yeah, and then you change that's even before you get to a product. That's just your right. customer and your problem. Yeah. Then you would add in the solution. And with the solution, there's all kinds of prototypes. What we could do is do a one pager uh, that has all the you know benefits of the home, or let's say it's a 3D press or whatever it is, like a standard. You know, what is our 3D printer kit? You know, it would have the cost, it would have the benefits, it would be the, all the things that you can do with it. It would be, you know, uh, all the... And then you would basically show that to someone who is role-playing as a customer that you're trying to sell to. Or maybe you've gone to a watering pond, a group of people where you know their customers are, or you know someone who's in the market to buy, and you're saying, hey, would you just kind of give me your your unfiltered reactions and then we would get on we would get honest and honest responses from people who could buy it and then we'll know pretty quickly how far off we are and then uh, then you you basically pause and you you uh, make the upgrades and then you try it again and again and again and again until you're you're make your eventually you'll get a sale yeah Where's this come from? This is like standard, standard BD business development. Is that is that where you have javelin board? I, I learned it through uh, javelin board is kind of like design thinking and uh, uh, a guy named Tom Chi, who is a good friend of mine in Caesars. Uh, he created the Google Glasses at Google, oh. and he's sort of an inventor. Um, and he has a concept called rapid prototyping. So the idea oh. is reducing the... F Most inventors, they go into their their cave yeah. Yeah. and they make thing, and they don't talk to anybody until they're finished and then nobody buys it. Yep. So what we want to do is find out... You want to reduce the feedback loop to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. days, not months. But, it, oh. you know, you have the customer. <laughs> days, not months. I like that. And okay, this, that's pretty if, cool. That's, if, that's really cool, yeah. If, if I can add, too, uh, uh, it also uh, sounds a lot like a kind of lean startup approach and uh, mm. and the and NSF, NSF that is? Yeah, uh, they have a, a program that, that we could participate in. I, I participate in it. Um, it's like a free program for entrepreneurs, and they'll help you. Um, they'll essentially walk you through that process. So you bring your business idea, and they'll walk you through this lean startup process, and the, you know, identifying the customers and your hypotheses and testing those through extensive interviews uh, with the idea of being that, yeah, you minimizing the amount of financial resources you need mm -hmm. to put in up at, at the front. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but everyone's just going to buy our house. <laughs> oh, True. I, um, we are no, going through this. That's not a real assumption. That, no, that takes work, right? Um, like the due diligence around that is like that's how you shortcut to the sales right it's like you got to do this due diligence is that the idea yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. right because that's that's a common fault uh, it's a common thinking and you'd think that when you're completing an experience in the field such as me then you think oh yeah you got a product you got sales no it's completely different things completely different things you can have something that you love and then you're using it or whatever um, but a business is just another development just like a product is so so this is completely consistent with all of that 
I would say. That's good. Uh, I would yeah, say and, uh, next week, I think that, uh, no, or, or a week, on the 22nd, uh, Tom, Tom's uh, team is coming into my class, and they're going to, they're going to host that. Ah. Uh, oh, that'll be actually I mean, worth looking at, worth participating in. If you guys are He's interested. take us to school. He's going to take us to UMKC. Can we come? <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome to come. I mean, it's it's happening. You could even call in. Oh yeah, we should. We should. So you're gonna have that on. You can do that on Jitsi, just like we're doing now, or whatever, uh, whatever uh, Zoom or whatever. That'll be good. Yeah, they're, be they're gonna be calling in, so you could mm. call in as well. But, okay. Um, yeah, cool. I I would say lean startup is different than rapid prototyping. Um, uh, but we don't have to get into the weeds on it. And they call it rapid prototyping of customers in what you say, what you're saying, and Javelin board. Yeah. Uh, rapid prototyping is. Um, yeah, it's Tom Chi's thing. I mean, he he's sort of developed it, but it it relates to uh, evolving your product. Basically, the difference between conjectures and actuals. Conjectures are your opinions, what you think people are going to want. Actuals are what actually happens. Uh, and then, so, uh, you're basically evolving the, proc the product in relationship to actual conversations. And yeah. there's there's yeah. ways that you can do that. What you're, what you're doing, yeah. Marchin, is uh, physical prototyping. Yeah. So you're making devices until they actually work. You can do that. Um, you have uh, that's that's really important as well. Um, so mm -hmm. this is just the other side to it, yeah. the business yeah. side. Mm. So I would pick a product. We can we can go through it. Um, I think that would be enormously valuable. How about the CD go home? Yeah. Rosebud. Can we do it on do it on it? That's what we're here for. We're developing it. Who's in? Or What's the one that you've sold uh, a bunch of? 3D printer. Will, will you talk about that? Last year we sold about 24 or so printers and got like about 20,000 last year, just on the side, over the last year, uh, since starting it. So it's cool. It's like back background revenue. And the product, if you just one prototype with the customer needs people want like this stuff that's fine there's not a question about it to me I, I look at it as as simple development of the back-end infrastructure not even like who the customers are because I think there's plenty of them and making the, this product simply accessible would be enough to take it to the next level but maybe what you're talking about for a real business we might have to really study that question in, in, in depth more uh, but so the 3D printer could be something that all of us, because we're going to be learning to build a bunch of them, uh, that would be something you can walk out of here as a sideline, like that we all collaboratively develop. So maybe different than the CD go home. That's the big, big one. Not everyone may pursue that. That's a big deal. Uh, I think that's a big commitment. But the 3D printer, uh, I think, could be a really good one to collaborate as a as a prototype experiment here. To rapid prototype the enterprise, which you're talking about here, uh, that uh, would be an interesting one. Huh? How do people find you to buy them? I don't know. Website? I, I have the product listing on a on a website. We spam the interwebs on Facebook and <laughs> things like that. We always just publish, just just regular edu marketing kind of deal, where just posting what we're doing and people find that. And uh, a lot of people come into it saying, "Hey, I want to support OSE," and that's why they buy it. They want to get into the community, like as in um, join a, a development effort, because we're not just selling a printer, we're selling uh, the capacity for you to actually get involved in prototyping and learning how to design things. Um, right. So that's the value that some people really like. That's the typical customer. So it's not like I just want to like print Yoda heads or whatever. It's, it's I want to learn to collaborate. I think a lot of people come with that kind of atmosphere around them but it's, they, a, it's a non-business it's like it's like a, this is this, I couldn't call it a business it's just something that 
happens here and there, but some deliberate development, I think, could, could get any of us passive revenue in the background. It's, uh, for the time I put into it, it's like a hundred bucks an hour that I get out of it for uh, have a little bit of production. Like I get some people to help out on production and then it's pretty easy to put together, especially like used to do like a finished tested kit, but I'm just going to switch that. I'm thinking it's almost good enough to do just, just the parts because for the finished kit, it takes you like twice as long to finish kit as in you test everything it takes a long time. It takes twice as much per shipment. And it's not a bad deal to, to say to somebody as a value proposition, learn how to solder. Um, so actually that's what I've been doing lately saying, Hey, uh, do you want to do this as a kit where you actually solder? Cause we like to prepare all that and test everything, but, um, it's not a big deal. If something's broken, you just ship a new one and it saves you a bunch of time. Cause, uh, that can be a bunch. It is a bunch of time to, to do just the parts versus a tested kit. And I don't think the tested kit gives you too much of an increase in value proposition because most people be, give up before they finish anyway. <laughs> a lot of people don't finish it. A lot of people buy really? it. There's probably like 50% probably don't finish it even. Uh, so that's that's been my experience. I've seen uh, I've seen a bunch of built ones. There's a couple that, so Ken and Jeff, they got one. Jeff never did his because he was busy working. <laughs> Ken did it because he's excited about, uh, he's actually sees the real potential of it as an enterprise. Uh, so he's had some fire under his pants for that. Uh, but the average, average Joe, if they've got a full-time job, then uh, it's, you know, it's like a second priority thing. It's you know, necessary to get it finished. But and the other thing that you're selling is the 3D pre uh, the brick press? Brick press, yeah. So the, a guy's buying a brick press for the uh, that we're going to build in November. There's a client there. He hasn't paid yet, but that's that's what it looks like. Um, and we've sold like one a year or so. Like just make one or so here and there. But any of these things can you put up a website and actually start marketing it. Any of these could be a, a decent business, especially if you have multiple products. Like okay, I might get one brick press, ten printers, five torch tables, and more. And it's easy, like 100K or whatever a year, you know. I mean, when I go to open source ecology website, I don't, I've never seen anywhere where I could buy anything. How about under the heading called product? OpenSourceEcology.org, products. It's down there? Yeah. I'm looking. But no, we're not marketing it. So you, if you haven't seen it, that's because it's not a business. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's know. more about the building it and the design than it is about, you know, like shop, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, like where I could just like, oh, like, it's a completely different way of presenting a product when you're selling it, right? It's like, what does the kid have? You know, show me pictures from, of it from way oh, yeah, different, yeah. all these are Yeah, you probably clicked on the compressor oh, block press. I just linked to the wiki page. We don't have any kind of a sales page for it. The D3D printer, we at least did a little photo shoot and just some description, but it's all just missing assets, missing business assets there. So any of these things, I think a collaborative effort on just to get one of these that, that then everybody, every one of us is selling that, I think that's a great idea. That's, that's something you can walk out of here and you've got some a little sideline that can generate as much as you put it put into it because the markets I think are going to be there well if we collaboratively develop and we have some marketing infrastructure and all those assets in place then it's an easy thing it's like you don't put it's like um, don't have to put a lot I of see. work in it if you divide that effort in between many people but for me it's like no I've, we've got other burners other <laughs> stakes in the fire or whatever uh, uh, so that hasn't been a great priority but it's there it's like ready ev every little one of these things is ready for the pick and it's like it's all there like if someone wants to make good money on it it's there for anybody but I mean the surprising thing for me is that nobody is taking that up you know that's that's a surprise for me but I, I see that uh, there's a difference between the you know the business and yeah yeah and just having some something that works reasonably it's the whole productization thing so
that's that's the question that's what's at hand here but imagine that you have to you know get a bunch of people collaborating on that because the market is billions near trillions right so there's not a shortage of market so if we get deliberate about marketing it this idea this this product yeah it could be really good that's that's the promise of collaborative development it could be realized uh, so what so do, is the, what do people is, think is the is the idea of that 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 like you know in this distributed manner like you know us in our own spots could could be producing these skits and selling them as well is that is that what you're thinking that's just correct yes it's and what what, source, it's what does it take so to it's, uh, generate the kit yeah so it's i mean it's really following the distributive enterprise aspect we mean that we produce them the machines we produce the business models that you can take and work freely from we publish all that all the economics of that printer like you can see the bills of materials it's all there and we encourage that do it it's you don't have to pay a royalty fee it's not a it's open source you can do whatever what it takes to build it is a, is a metal cutoff saw a th another 3d printer to print parts and a bunch of sales from AliEx Express or Amazon and that's it what's the, what's the most intensive process there you need to cut some materials to size cut the belts cut the rods uh, we have a insulated heated bed so we actually weld up the insulated bed because it's actually 30 percent more en energy efficient than anything out there i mean it's it's a killer what we have actually is a killer product if we actually communicate that to the world it's it's better than anything else out there actually in terms of extrusion rate for soft materials uh it's got the, our design extruder which is as far as i can see it's the fastest rubber printing extruder that exists and we've got the heated bed which is uh uh 30 percent more efficient took some data on that uh, so you actually you got an eco printer and we're going to develop the hot temperature chamber which now takes you to the ten thousand dollar and up machines so uh, it's a killer right there anything i'm saying here is a billion dollar or more industry it's it's good uh, but to, to do it you just have to do some due diligence you got to learn how to build it the fabrication part is minimal like you got to do the little soldering little snip and s snap there on wires uh cut some materials to size and we are the only the most complicated thing there like for the advanced printer the the pro is you got to weld the heated bed for the other one it's actually screwed together all you got to do is like drill out one piece but these these kinds of things you can outsource too so you can get right now i get the six by six inch beds bed pieces for the d3d universal i just get that from metal by the foot quite reasonable they all cut it to size and then you just cut some other materials to size on a abrasive cutoff saw kind of like the wood saw but with a, an abrasive blade so infrastructure for manufacturing this is like a hundred bucks well plus a welder if you're welding the thing um, yeah it's 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 a great sideline garage business and this could be livelihood for many people if they chose to so yeah yeah it's out there so it's like you know when i see that it's like wow i wish i had that when i was growing up um well i mean reprap in principle exists but you don't get it from reprap there is no single product there that you can actually replicate as the real thing that's been tested it works and all that and actually supports you in enterprise no that does not exist all that prusa whatever all the other printers they went proprietary they kind of went proprietary no they're somewhat open source but most of them went proprietary you don't get the support like that in terms of the enterprise aspect so here it's it's a golden opportunity it's it's a thing um and we can be selling things like here's training for people who want to get into production of this that that could be that's another business whole business katarina yeah katarina <laughs> wants to go home and uh yeah so we should start wrapping up but uh, i i would say let's maybe finish by saying let's do something what do we do? Uh, I would say I, I would suggest a 3D printer get work some assets around it. Photo shoots, uh, finish the manuals, back and back office, some marketing infrastructure, and collaborate on that so all of us benefit because we're not in competition with one another. The market's too large, and we can build better products where all of us benefit. Nobody in the world is doing this. There's no distributed enterprise that I 
as I described right now. So that would be a first, and we should do that. Um, and let's start talking exist. to customers. Yeah, start talking to customers. Uh, we know they're there. I mean, people without any advertising, we get one or two by word of mouth. Well, so to develop a business, yeah, probably, like you're saying, Matt, yeah, that would be probably the proper thing to do. And then we can actually all use that and say, okay, this is exactly the product market fit. And uh, we can pursue that. So, yeah. Should we do that? or? Uh, so, actually, oh, we're supposed to have the... Right. <laughs> Decisions are made much better with cake, Katrina says. But... Do not despair because we have two sessions like this every week and the next one happens to be tomorrow yeah. <laughs> so let's continue the discussion oh, yeah. uh, we, we want to have these two a day so we didn't have one yesterday we're gonna have one tomorrow let's maybe um, decide on something that we all want to commit to as a group that's what this was supposed to be we're saying yeah. we're collaboratively developing some enterprise that we all say this is cool we can actually do this and it's worth it because you don't have to put the hundred percent effort with 10 people you need only to put forth 10% and you still win 100%. It's a good return on your effort. So let's take it, take it away tomorrow again. Yeah? Let's leave it at All right. Here. Thank you. Yeah? All right. See you later. Okay. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs>